So to just introduce myself, my name is Dan Garfield. I'm the Chief Technology Evangelist for CodeFresh. I'm also a Google developer expert focused on cloud and Kubernetes and DevOps and all those kinds of things. Um, and I'm also a member of the Forbes Technology Council. Uh, so I spend most of my time focused on speaking about, well, <laughs> speaking and writing and doing um, DevOps and, and kind of practitioner work uh, and kind of evangelizing um, technology solutions uh, to improve your development workflows. Now, one of the things that um, is kind of unique about this talk is that I'm focusing on how to talk about business value. Normally, I'm giving talks that involve writing some code, maybe doing a demo. Uh, this is a different kind of talk. And actually, I think it's very, very timely because uh, we're heading into um, uh, some times where people are going to be asking some very different questions about your DevOps organization. So with that, um, I would just say that uh, the reason that I'm, one of the reasons I'm interested in this is because CodeFresh, we focus on the build and delivery loop. We're basically a CI CD solution. And so these are conversations I have with our customers, our end users, our partners all the time. And so a lot of the data that I'm gonna share with you today comes from those conversations, comes from real case studies, and I'll try to re uh, reference those. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are heading into kind of a different territory here. Um, we've got a little bit, um, the conversation last month was all about how can we move faster? How can we actually get our, our applications faster? How do we make sure our engineers are super happy? How do we make sure that we're delivering code as fast as possible? We've got to beat out the competition. We're a race to the top. And unfortunately, next month, the conversation is all going to be about how do we reduce costs? So that's a very different kind of conversation. It's a different kind of mode of operation. Um, so this talk could not, I think, come in a more timely time. I started working on it months ago, so this is, this is even better. Well, it's terrible, whatever, it's, uh, it's a situation. So um, it's kismet, I suppose. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that and um, really how to talk dollars and cents. Now, the, the big issue is that engineering and, and the business writ large often don't speak the same language. Engineers wanna talk about interesting solutions, they wanna talk about innovation, they wanna talk about scalability and, and, and really uh, really features if you think about it. Uh, and the business always wants to talk dollars. They, they don't really care about any of that stuff. If I talk to our, our CFO, um, he just always tells me, that just sounds like fluff, I don't know what that means, what does that mean in dollars? And I'm like, well, it's gonna be big. You, know, you gotta tell them, you, you have to find a way to translate what we're doing into dollars and cents so that it can make sense to the business. And they can make rational, informed decisions about where they're gonna put uh, dollars going forward. Um, and, a, and a good preamble to this talk and something that made me think about this kind of going back a few years ago was there was this really interesting blog post by a guy named Michael Lynch and uh, he had quit Google. And one of the, what basically what happened to Michael was um, he was really focused on hunting down bugs. And so he figured out a way to get bugs to be exposed in a much more visible way. And he thought that this was really good progress and he was able to squash a lot of bugs. But at the end of the day, when he sat down and he did a performance review, people said, looks like you just increased the bugs. So you must not be a very good engineer. And so what he discovered was that even though an engineer, you would think in all these engineers that he was talking to would understand like, hey, I figured out that there were all these bugs happening that we didn't know about. At the end of the day, they only looked at it and saw that the bug count was larger. Uh, it's almost a bad Dilbert cartoon. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a bummer. So if we could find a better way to speak about these things, it would be even better. Um, just a word of uh, caution as we go into these numbers. Um, I'm gonna share numbers that are real. I'm gonna sh share calculations that are real and I'm gonna share real use cases as well as sort of theoretical ones. Um, just be aware that sometimes, uh, you know, numbers are, don't tell the whole story. And I would be very, very happy to get pull requests from you to get um, some different ideas about maybe you think there are better ways to measure these things that I'm putting forth here. If you have them, send them on over. Um, I would love to, I would love to take them. So let's talk about DevOps. We're gonna go through four ways in which DevOps provides value. We're gonna talk about how to calculate those dollars, how to calculate that value. And we're also gonna cover tools to help you um, and, and also talk about building versus buying and, and that decision and how that goes. So typically within DevOps, you really have two disciplines. You have productivity engineering, they're focused on how do we make our engineers more efficient, right? How do we deliver code faster? They're, they're, you can think of them like automation experts, assembly line experts. They're there to make the um, engineering 
organization as efficient as possible. And on the other side, you have the site reliability engineers and they're focused on keeping uptime. We wanna keep the application running. We wanna have predictability. We don't ever wanna have downtime. We're gonna fight for that. Um, so the metrics that go into those two sides, and these are very important. If you're not tracking these already, you should start tracking these because they're gonna be very valuable for you. Uh, productivity engineering is looking at change lead time. So how long does it take from the moment you make a code change uh, to the time that it's actually deployed, as well as deploy frequency? How often can we get those changes out? And, and site reliability engineering is thinking about mean time to recovery and uptime. And from a business standpoint, um, you're saying, well, the engineering is faster. Our engineering is faster. We're more agile. That's, that's something they can understand a little bit better than just saying, hey, our change lead time frequency, our change lead time is really low. It does make sense to them. We deploy really fast and we're really agile. Okay, that makes sense to them. Site reliability engineering, it's very simple. If website don't work, it don't sell. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a simpler thing to explain to people. So the first one we're gonna talk about is avoiding downtime. And I think this one is, is fairly clear to people, um, but there is some easy calculations you can do. Uh, we, uh, we recently had a lot of people dealing with downtime. Um, I was actually just thinking uh, last night, there was a game I was trying to play on my iPad and it was down. Um, a lot of organizations, especially right now, are dealing with very uneven and unpredicted amounts of volume. And that downtime is incredibly expensive. Last Black Friday, uh, Costco lost, uh, what was it, $11 million because their site crashed on, on, uh, over Thanksgiving weekend. And if you think about when downtime happens, it happens, it's most likely to happen when you're experiencing your most valuable time as a business. Uh, so that makes that, that downtime actually more expensive than it otherwise would have been, right? Um, Southwest Airlines a few years ago went through an outage that cost them about $82 million. Uh, and Amazon uh, went down for 13 minutes last year and it cost them $2.6 million in lost sales. Um, just shocking, uh, shocking numbers, um, obviously from these large retailers. Um, now, you might be tempted looking at this and say, well, you know, really to get revenue, you have to have engineering has to be working, but so does marketing, so does sales. And it's not like we can attribute 100% of our revenue to engineering, right? Because marketing is doing something too, or sales is doing something. Well, that's not really true. In fact, you need all three of these things working together in order for you to have a, a, a model that actually works. So um, what I actually recommend for the formula here is simply take your annual revenue, divided by the minutes in a year, and that gives you a dollar amount per minute of how valuable those services are. Um, and you can get more specific if you have a specific product that you wanna to speak to, you can look at the revenue of that product and the projected revenue of the product. I would actually look at what you're expecting to do in the next year and say, this is the importance of, of avoiding the downtime. Uh, and so this is how the calculation for Amazon went. They were making about $107 billion a year, divided by 365, divided by 24, divided by 60 minutes, gives them uh, about $200,000 per minute of downtime at Amazon for, um, I think it was 2018, 2019, right? So this is a fairly simple one uh, to calculate. And it's a very important metric because anytime you deal with downtime, you should be pointing at this. Um, and uh, we'll talk about why this number is in some ways potentially inflated and why it's also potentially deflated. Actually, it's, it's underestimating the cost. Um, something to be aware of and maybe something to translate for your business side is that helping them understand that getting to, everybody will say they want five nines of uptime. Most people have no idea what five nines of uptime means. Even if you tell them that means we only get five minutes of downtime per year, that starts to get the idea. But um, I actually like to use the example of the 24 at Le Mans. This is a race where people have a car and it has to run, you know, flat out for 24 hours in order to win. And the amount of engineering and work and planning that goes into getting to that is enormous. And so when people talk about the kind of uptime they wanna to get to, they need to understand that there's also an investment that's going to be associated with that. And that investment is easily measurable against the business value. If you're losing $200,000 per minute of downtime, you can definitely invest a few dollars to try to avoid a minute of downtime, right? Um, so what, what you wanna have is a baseline, right? We're currently at, 99.8% uptime. So we have about 17 hours a year of downtime. Well, now you can actually just take that time and you'd say, okay, currently we, we would be losing roughly this dollar amount. And so anything that I invest that's under that is saving us money. 
Um, and, and that's actually something that's fairly simple for business to understand. You need all these components to work together. I'm going to go a little bit faster. Um, the, uh, the two teams of DevOps are usually in competition, right? The productivity engineers are trying to do code delivery faster and the site reliability engineers are trying to do more uptime. And those values are sometimes opposed if you're not doing regular uh, kind of continuous delivery kind of methodologies, right? Um, so this is actually another aspect. You would think that the, the uptime argument would say you should release less. And in fact, what you have are fewer changes, but they're huge and they're much higher risk changes. So if you can move to daily releases or hourly releases or release on demand, um, each of those changes is small and very low risk. And so the, the, the likelihood of any individual change leading to downtime actually goes down. And um, so you can communicate to your business that this actually reduces risk of downtime and it also enforces a discipline on yourselves and, and a discipline for the team to actually optimize for this, right? Okay, so number two is delivering faster. Um, so delivering faster, um, I, uh, I have this quote that I, uh, I quote from myself, which is undelivered code has the same value as unwritten code. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard an engineer say, it's all done, I wrote the code. Is it done? It's not deployed. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's done though. It's like, this is useless. If, if the code is written, but it's not actually deployed, it's not doing anything for anybody. Now, the code that you write always has business value. Every single line of code you write should have business value. If it doesn't, then everybody's gonna wonder why the heck it is that you're working on it. Everything you're working on should have business value associated with it, right? So, um, I'm gonna give you an example. This is, uh, this is actually a case study we did with Steelcase, and they reduced their code delivery cycle from three days to three hours. So, they cut three days essentially off of how long it takes for them to deliver code. And think of every deployment, every commit as having a dollar amount on it. This is kind of the business value that I expect for this to bring. And maybe you don't know all of them, but you can guess some of them. I actually, uh, a friend, uh, the director of engineering at an organization, they were working on a change. It was a single change that they were getting deployed that was worth $10 million a year in extra revenue. So if you can get that deployed three days faster, what does that mean? Well, there's actually a calculation you can use. So um, in, in the example of seal case, they've got about $3.4 billion a year in revenue. This is a uh, 2019 revenue. Um, and, uh, I made a rough estimation that about $300 million of this was from active changes that their team was making. And so if we were able to cut that down three days, it means that the dollars, just because they arrive faster means they make an extra two and a half million dollars as a company. Uh, and so you can imagine if you can cut the time to deliver your code and it gets down from, if it's at months, you get it down to weeks. If it's at weeks, you get it down to days. If it's at days, you get it down to hours. And the amount of money that your business is going to make more is going to go up. And I know this is kind of uncomfortable for engineers. It's like, ah, you know, I want to talk about the beauty of the thing I'm writing. Look, I get it. I get it. You don't need to convince me. You need to convince your CFO. And they probably don't care about it. <laughs> they probably care about the dollars. So you may as well just speak their language when you're talking to them. And we can come and have like an empathy session together where we recognize that they should be more into the poetry of, of the work that we're doing. That's fine. Um, so uh, the calculation is very simple. You basically take the business value multiplied by the days saved and divide that by the number of days in the year. And that's how you get to the amount of business value that you get earlier. Now, if you, uh, if, if you don't know how much value your engineers delivered, a rule of thumb is to take the total cost of your engineering salaries and multiply it by eight. Uh, now that multiplier varies widely by industry and by organization. Some organizations, it is like 1.2. Some organizations, it's a lot more. So um, this is, a, this is a sort of an average that I gathered by doing some research. Uh, if you think you have a better rule of thumb and some data to back it up, I'd love to see it. Uh, but as a rough rule of thumb, if you take all your engineers, they should be providing about 8x their salary in terms of business value overall. Um, and so that can be something you can do. So what we're really talking about is taking that code and delivery loop and shrinking it as much as we can, right? We want to make it as fast and shortened as possible because we know that that's actually going to give us the dollars faster. And um, 
a, a, the, the measurement time between when you write the code, when you deploy, I mentioned earlier, that's your lead time to change. Uh, that's that that average number is what you want to draw down and if you can if you can present a project and say hey we want to revamp our ci cd or we want to revamp this release process or we want to revamp the testing we think it's going to re reduce our lead time to change by one day you now have a dollar amount you can just stick on that and say this is what it's worth to the business so you tell me the priority you're you, you're saying that you want this this box done or this other project done or this other thing done but you're telling me you don't want to invest in the tool or whatever the thing is Here's the dollar amount that we're giving up just by not by not doing this project. So you tell me if, you, if we want to save, if we want to make an extra three million dollars next year, let's spend a hundred thousand dollars to invest in this this project, right? That's a very easy decision for a business to make. Okay, uh, the third is saving engineering time. Now, in a world where your engineers are um, potentially going to jump ship at any moment then it's more relevant for, uh, for you to, to make sure they're happy. In this climate, it's actually a little bit more relevant for you to focus on how you're showing that you can do more with less. Um, all right, so the value of cutting uh, the build times of just by just five minutes, uh, what does that translate to? Well, you take your total number of engineers and you take their average salary per minute. Um, and uh, there's, I'll show you the details on this. And then you multiply it by the number of builds you did do per day per engineer on average. Um, and then you multiply it by the time savings. And so if you have a thousand engineers and you can cut um, just five minutes off of your average build time, that translates to about $8 million in savings per year. Uh, now you might be thinking, looking at this and saying, well, you know, I make a commit the build's happening. Maybe I just go get a drink of water, you know, and, uh, and so I'm not really waiting for it. So maybe it doesn't really translate that well. The truth is that in aggregate, it does add up this way because for every time that somebody might be just going to get a drink of water, then they, you know, they get pulled into other things. They, they, uh, they lose their focus on the project they're working on. Um, and, and actually you end up having people that spend way more than the allotted time of build savings. So it actually cuts both ways and you end up um, uh, realizing savings pretty similar to this. I mean, this is, this is actually fairly accurate. Um, surprisingly, every time uh, it's been done, it's, it uh, comes out very similarly. Um, uh, this was a, a case study we did with a company called Hover um, and it is, <laughs> it's kind of a code fresh testimonial, but uh, they basically took their build times from two and a half hours to 12 minutes. Now they are not a thousand person organization, right? They're, they're in the dozens of engineers. But if you imagine, we were talking about saving five minutes, you're talking about saving an hour, that adds up. So if you want to invest in your build systems or in your automation systems to shorten the time, you now have a calculator that you can use to do this. Um, one thing that's optional and just to be aware of, most people when they first do this calculation, they, took the, they, they usually take the average engineering salary and just multiply it by the number of engineers you actually need to add an overhead cost. Uh, so the overhead of employing someone is usually like the cost of their health benefits, the cost of, of the upkeep of the staff, the cost of HR, all those things kind of layered on top gives you your overhead per employee. If you don't know what yours is, I would recommend just using 20%. That's pretty standard. In some organizations, it's more like 30%. Some organizations, more like 10%, depending on the benefits and the overhead and like things like that. You can usually get this from your finance team. Just ask them and they'll give you it. Um, uh, but otherwise, um, this, this calculation is pretty solid. So uh, you can go with those defaults. Uh, number four, reducing infrastructure overhead. So uh, this is where I really advocate for going cloud native, right? Getting into Kubernetes and containers. And this is something that um, a lot of you are gonna have to face over the next few months. If you're in the middle of a project to move to Kubernetes, you're gonna have to, you're gonna be asked, What's the, what's the dollar value of what you're trying to do? Um, is this all just about like, you know, geek speak, like saving, uh, having a better architecture, blah, blah, blah. They don't get that. What you want to say to them is, look, 30% of infrastructure budgets for on-prem are spent on idle machines already. So if we need to move to the cloud, we can actually probably cut, uh, we can actually make, take some cuts on this already. Second, when we're moving to cloud native, we can do tighter packing, which is, which is basically of the, of the resources we're paying for, we can put more things into those resources and there's less, um, 
less empty space, so to speak. It's like when you pack a box, if it's full of, it's full of tiny, uh, you know, spheres, it packs way more tightly than if it's full of big spheres, right? They, they take it, they have more room in between them, right? So um, tighter packing is important. Auto scaling is very, very important, especially right now when people are having really up and down peak and load times, being able to auto scale up and then auto scale back down, which is something that's much, much easier to do when you're using something like Kubernetes. Uh, that's also going to go into it because instead of planning capacity based on your peak, you're planning for expansion and elasticity based on your peaks and lows, right? So you're gonna save a lot of money on that. Another, uh, another thing you can do is spot instances. And I expect that Spotinst, if you're not familiar with their company, they basically move, they'll help you move your uh, workloads onto spot instances on Amazon. These are, these are instances that are pennies on the dollar because they could be destroyed at any time. That kind of infrastructure is much, much easier to use when you are going cloud native. When you have something like Kubernetes and you can reschedule pods, um, that actually works really well. And in many cases, it reduces costs by 90% of infrastructure. So uh, spot instances, if you're going for Google, they have uh, the same kind of thing. It's called preemptible nodes. Works great. You can create a node pool with preemptible nodes and you can watch it scale up and down um, and it works pretty well. So uh, that's definitely something that's worth uh, potentially investing in. I don't have a calculation on this one, uh, but I give you a 90% number and a 30% number so you can multiply those out fairly easily. Um, a last note on build versus buy. Um, this, was, uh, this was actually something that um, one of our customers did and they, uh, they were using a hand-rolled deployment to tool. They had two full-time engineers maintaining it. The, the big takeaway from this is that often people underestimate their build costs compared to their buy costs. Uh, there's a great tool you can use, and there's a link here called at barometrics.com slash build versus buy. You can see the link there on the bottom. And you just put in your variables, and this is the actual numbers that these people ran. They uh, saved about a quarter million dollars a year by deciding to just buy a tool off the shelf. Now, it won't always work out that way. It depends a lot on your use case. Uh, a lot of use cases, it does make sense to build it. Um, but classically, people overestimate how much they're gonna save by building something versus buying something. You have to really do some magical math to try to make it uh, justified. So in summary, don't be afraid to put the cost to paper. People may argue about if the number is inflated or if the number is too low, but now they're arguing around a number. So now, now you actually have something to argue about rather than just an ephemeral, hey, I think we're gonna be able to save money. That doesn't mean anything. But if you say, hey, I'm gonna think we're gonna be able to save $2 million by investing in our DevOps organization or by buying this tool or by revamping our infrastructure, um, now people can actually look at those costs and say, okay, well, that might be a little inflated, might be a little low, let's look at it. Sure, let's do it. So that's number one. DevOps, I think, is one of the most valuable investments a business can make, especially this year. Uh, try to speak their language and then use the equations we've shared. I've got a uh, calculator. All these calculators are available at codefresh.io slash webinars slash making business uh, case DevOps. And you can just find that if you go to codefresh.io slash blog, it's the, it's the last blog post that's up there. Um, so there's actually a spot where you can just put in your numbers and plug them in. Um, also some related resources. Uh, we, did a, we did some content around CI CD pipelines for microservices, which I highly recommend. Uh, Multi-cloud canary with failover is more relevant than ever, given that people are trying to disperse their infrastructure. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and then destroying build times is, a, is another talk that we did. Just focus, a tech talk just focused on how you uh, lower build times. So with that, whew, you've been a great listening audience. Lots of great uh, shouting and cheering that I can hear from home, just in my mind's eye. Um, and we'll, we can move to questions. Thank you. We have everybody on mute, so you can't hear the cheering. <laughs> so we do have, we have a couple questions. Uh, so the first question is, uh, given current trends, what area of DevOps do you think is the most important to focus on from the business value standpoint? Yeah, so I would say that um, the avoiding downtime conversation is especially relevant right now. Um, for, for a lot of people who are having big spikes right now, that's one that you, you probably want to hammer on and say, look, if we wanted to have a scalable business, this cloud native thing is really critical. We really need to, to get finished migrating into containers. We need to take advantage of cloud infrastructure. Um, that cloud infrastructure one, I think is super critical because a lot of times like something like Spotinst makes it so cheap and easy to migrate to those that cheaper infrastructure um, with very low risk and it's very easy and it's a lot of dollars saved right up front. Um, and then I would also give a pitch for your CI CD system. And uh, a lot of people have kind of hacked together CI CD systems. 
you want to have something that's really robust and scalable that works for everybody because that automation, you know, if it works every day, it's paying dividends every day. If it breaks a lot, it's just costing you money every day. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, one other question here. Uh, you talked a lot about different ways that you can talk to the business about how to convince them that DevOps is important and the value that it brings. Uh, for someone who's in that position where they're trying to convince either the business or even other engineers that this is important, what are some good strategies for building consensus uh, mm. once you have some of this data that you've been talking about? Yeah, so, so as you get this data together and as you, as you run these calculators and you actually pull these out and just stick them into a document, getting them circulated is obviously going to be very valuable, but you always want to speak to find your allies, your advocates, the people that are going to, are going to advocate for your cause. And you're going to want to make sure that this stuff makes sense to their interests. So if, if I'm a, a DevOps and I'm trying to make a business case that we're going to invest in our automation systems so that our lead time to change goes down, my biggest advocate should be the head of engineering, right? You want to talk to the head of engineering and say, look, I, I think, if we do X, Y, and Z, we're going to be able to make your engineers 20% more efficient. Look, based on these calculations, I think we'd actually make like an extra $5 million a year. And this is only going to cost us like $100,000 to invest in. Um, that person becomes a huge advocate and, and prep them beforehand, right? You want to gather all your allies so that when you start circulating this data around, you know that there are going to be several voices that are saying, yes, I really like this. I think it's super critical that we do it that kind of consensus with those dollars and cents. And, and you definitely don't want to put up these numbers and then have your head of engineering say, yeah, I don't really buy it. Because th they're supposed to be, they're the ones you're helping. You just lost your biggest advocate. So you want to talk to them individually first. And you want to do that with each of the groups that you want to engage with. And then when you circulate it widely, you have your advocates that are going to stand up and say, yeah, absolutely. And even when you circulate, you say, hey, I was talking to the head of engineering. They said that if anything, these numbers are underinflated. Well, now you've drawn them in on your side. You're now presenting a united front. Uh, and now if the finance team is looking at this, they're saying, okay, well, everybody's telling me the same thing. They're telling me these numbers are real. They're telling me this is legitimate. This seems like a no brainer to invest, you know, in an extra engineer or an extra, um, you know, uh, in, in extra tooling or whatever it is. So basically speak your audience's language and gather allies, right? Yes. Awesome. I also wanted to mention, I saw a great talk from uh, GDC recently from when they did the virtual game developers conference. And uh, the speaker was talking about how using CICD and DevOps had completely changed the way that their game development company did their, their business. So it was a great use case for all these things that you're talking about. Mm. They talked about all the time that they saved and how it changed their lives. So it was really cool to hear. <laughs> yeah, if I could get Valve to apply these principles to Half-Life 3, I mean, that would just be something else. <laughs> Half-Life 4 or 3? Never well, I don't think Alex counts. <laughs> I don't think they count, right. So for the related resources, um, this deck can be available to everybody after the presentations uh, today. So you can just go in and click on these links so you don't have to try to screenshot this. Uh, but if you wanted to, this video is going to be posted here uh, in the next few days online and on YouTube as well. Um, Cool. Thanks, Dan. That was the last of the questions that we had for you. Okay. Thank you. Take care, everybody, and good luck out there.